Um, I'm Konrad Henel, and well, as you know, I'm talking about um, scientific and product visualization with Blender, um, a professional's perspective, and I guess uh, what's uh, more interesting for you is uh, the prof uh, professional aspect, because uh, working for clients uh, with Blender, like I do, is uh, distinctly different um, from doing, doing it uh, in your free time. There are actually uh, there are time and budget constraints, and you absolutely must deliver on time all the time. And um, well, I did a couple of projects uh, in the recent years, and um, I go into some details uh, of them. I hope you're going to like it. Um, well, let's see. How do I get out of here? Okay. Ah, oh, crap. Okay. I've never used Windows Vista before, and everything's different. And uh, the first project I'm going to talk about is um, was for Siemens. Um, I just uh, the the topic of this project was an animation. They um, were about to release a new hearing aid, a very revolutionary hearing aid with Wi-Fi, actually. Um, so, well, new groundbreaking technology. And uh, most of the projects I do work like this. Um, a producer approaches me. They are doing a short TV segment, um, let's say um, three to eight minutes long, about uh, technology in general. And um, it is sponsored by a company, in this case Siemens. And to explain their new technology, whatever it may be, they rely on animation. Because uh, sometimes they just have very little time, three minutes, it's really nothing to explain something, and um, yeah, they, they love to have things animated, people like it, looks cool, looks slick, and um, it's a great way of communicating technology quickly. So the producer appro then approaches me and tells me what the client, in this case Siemens, wants to see, what's the idea of the technology, and um, together I do some animation, he does the rest, uh, filming, and there's always voiceovers over these animations. So um, I don't have the sound actually here. Uh, I never really get to hear it, um, but the animation works with a voiceover. So probably it's not understandable just by looking at it, but there should be voice over it. Well, let's have a look at it. Well, um, obviously a hearing aid and um, with a very detailed uh, interior and three uh, microphones, as far as I recall, and some two, wow, very powerful chips. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what they told me, you know. It's, and they do some impressive calculations, I don't know, three-dimensional hearing and stuff, and a Wi-Fi um, conductor. But the cool thing is, that's a human head, um, a tweaked one. Yeah, these two devices communicate with one another, and that's about it. And um, well, the time frame was pretty short on that one, just uh, one week. Um, fortunately, they provided me with uh, cat data uh, in the form of a Wavefront OBJ file, and um, the import went pretty smoothly, and it was very risky because, um, like so often, working with Blender, I never tested that before. I never really had complicated cat data to import. And I just hoped it would work. Uh, fortunately, it did. Still needed quite a bit of tweaking. Uh, it wasn't uh, uh, that easy. And um, apart from that, uh, animating materials, animating transparency, uh, it all didn't work so easily. Um, well, what more can I say? Ah, and that was uh, the first Blender release um, that had um, ambient occlusion. And I really love this ambient occlusion lighting. As you can see, it's really very very natural light in there. Um, I think it, I, li I lit the whole scene with only one spot, and the rest is all ambient occlusion. And well, they loved it. It, it looks really natural, and rendering times were absolutely acceptable. And this is a really, really detailed object. Um, yeah, it really worked well with Blender. And thing is, uh, the interesting thing is, um, it took about a day to render the whole animation. Sure, sure, go ahead. Um, wait, wait a minute. 
you, know, you use a GI renderer or and no, and um, no actually uh, it is a Blender internal renderer, but uh, with ambient occlusion activated. You know ambient occlusion, and it really works well with a very detailed model because there's a lot of um, subtle shading within uh, the model. Well, we can have a look at it again. The res resolution, unfortunately, is pretty low, but it's really it's nicely shaded everywhere, and see all these these nice edges and well, just work perfectly. And the thing is, um, the clients um, they well you know they have no idea of rendering times. They um, they don't realize that even rendering a 30 second animation takes one to two days. And uh, just shortly before I had to deliver it, they said, oh, actually, um, we love the animation, it's cool, but uh, can't we have the whole hearing aid in blue? We want a different color. And that's another two days of rendering. You can't do it in the post. I tried uh, adjusting the color, but it just wouldn't work. So, um, well, I had uh, my machine work all night, did it in blue. And uh, shortly after that, they said, well, no, we just, it was just an idea, blue looks good, but actually, uh, let's stick with the original. <laughs> this, this, uh, that happens a lot, really, no kidding. That's just uh, clients, they do this kind of stuff. Okay, um, that's um, a product visualization, obviously. But uh, from, a, from a work, um, or from a business, point of view it's all the same uh, for me scientific visualization product visualization in the end it's just uh, 3d models with some uh, distinct functionality and an animation that tries to explain whatever is happening as good as possible um, okay which one I, I actually have more projects than I can show you in this short amount of time oh, it's running out already um, yeah one project I really loved uh, was uh, the Messelunge that was from the Fraunhofer Society. Uh, I did some, some very small animations for them, once again with, together with the producer, and when they um, saw these, they approached me directly because they wanted uh, a larger animation project for, their, for trade fairs. Because it's a scientific institute, Fraunhofer Institute, they, their business is actually research, part, partially state or federal funded, but the uh, big uh, part of the budget comes from the industry, so they need to go to trade fairs, do marketing, and well, get funding. And for that, they need animations to um, well, communicate what they're actually doing. Everybody loves animation, and they came to me and said, well, can you do some animation of our research? Um, and that was uh, late 2003, early 2004. Blender was by far not as advanced as it is now back then, but still um, I thought, well, I think I can do it. And um, yeah, I did it. Uh, the, well, let's, let's have a look at it. I hope I have the right version here. Uh -huh. Looking good. Not this big, no. Right, and uh, Wow, what can I say? Um, Lung, everything is hand modeled. Uh, the the bronze here, the um, this part of the lung, that's actually a displacement texture. Uh, no UV mapping. I can't do UV mapping at all. I never do it. I never use it. Procedural textures, and here we go. And particles. And uh, um, the topic is particles in the lung, so obviously you have to use particles but they were terrible. Um, I thought, uh, how bad can they be? And uh, I had almost no control over them. So every particle here is actually hand animated along a spline. Um, yeah, all these cells you see here, every, each and every cell is all painstakingly uh, modeled by hand. It really took quite some time to get this insight of uh, an alveolus right. And well, some nice shape animations. Um, oh, there's really everything in there. Uh, shape animation, uh, animation along lattices, uh, along splines. And this is what happens if you smoke, like I do. <laughs> these, uh, these white cells, um, the 
the macrophages, they um, pick up the particles, but they can't pick them up all, and the rest of the particles enter actually enter your lung and stay there till you die. And, um, and uh, this project really took a long time. Uh, it was <laughs> actually, it took me almost uh, three years to finish it. Not working on it all the time. Uh, the, the customer, there were times when I couldn't reach them for like uh, three quarters of a year. And then all of a sudden they called, hey, uh, how's the project progressing? Um, uh, how are you doing? Okay. And so I got back to it uh, by, by then with a completely different Blender version. and. Um, you know, this is very important. Uh, the lung, you know, these fibers in the lung, they make the transport. And that wasn't possible when I started the project. There was no real uh, usable hair renderer. And now there is. And uh, you can even animate the hair smoothly. And it was really important for them to see these kind of dynamics. And, well, all of a sudden it was no problem with Blender anymore. And uh, when I started the project, there was no way you could actually animate this. It just wasn't possible. Yeah, they really love that. Um, it's uh, like most projects recently, it's all rendered in HD. You know, everybody loves HD now, though nobody can actually really see it, but um, it's gotta be HD. Uh, takes a lot of rendering time, four times the time than standard PAL, but well, computers are getting faster as well, so no problem there. Okay, this is the Messelunge. And um, well, it's also very interesting to know um, the clients, uh, if you work for clients, um, they, they have a need to communicate something and they realize, okay, animation is the way to go. Um, and they also know it's very expensive because it's time consuming. Actually, they think it's more expensive than it has to be. I'm kind of cheap, um, but uh, they, they really have no problem with that. But um, they you really cannot show them any steps along the way. They have no idea. If you show them preview renderings, preview animations, they always say, this is how it looks. Um, they, they can't uh, make the step to final rendering just from a preview. So basically you're, you're working in the dark because you can show them anything until you render the final result. And then they look at it, um, have probably uh, some ideas on what to change, so render it again. And I tried giving them animatics and say, just look at the dynamics, at the camera angles and everything. They saw it, uh, op OpenGL previews, and you know how these look, really, really bad. And they saw it, I, I told them specifically, don't look at the shading and everything, Look, just look at the dynamics, does your message come through? They saw it and said, well, this looks horrible. Is this how it's gonna look like? <laughs> no, <laughs> told you, it won't, but well, they never really get it. So um, you really have to calculate um, the time to make the finished animation, show it to the client, and then get to it again and re-render it. And um, so for these projects, you really can't, the rendering time is everything. I always say if a frame doesn't render in under eight minutes, then I've got to change it. Eight minutes is absolute tops for any rendering. Because uh, for 30 seconds, um, well, you can do the math, I can't. Uh, that's, that's pretty long if you want to render it like this. Okay, uh, how's the timing? Oh, still got time, that's good. Um, yeah, and um, during the time I was uh, doing the Messelunge, um, somebody I knew at uh, Kneisel, she approached me, and they uh, were, were about to release a new she, and um, well, they, they wanted, um, well, it's a very special kind of she, but, uh, well, it's hard to explain with words, so let's have a look at it as well. Oh, I don't see anything here. Okay. Um, that was uh, special in a way because um, this animation wasn't to be used in context or with a voiceover. It had to work without sound and uh, it had to be standalone. They wanted to show this at trade fairs and everything and it was their their new prime product, it was really all important for them and, well, put quite some pressure on me and it was uh, probably at the time, uh, when did I do it, that was 2004 as well, 
uh, the most complicated production I ever did. And thing is, well, I I used to work alone. That changed recently, but back then it was only me. And yeah, here we go. The Kneisler she. I really had to hand model the whole she, which was really interesting, I must say. Modeling a she is much more complicated than one would think. And uh, well, the idea is these she's. Look at this, they have uh, some, well, how, how can I say this? Glide modules, world first. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Definitely get paid for this. Um, no, 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 sorry, no, 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 not at all. Um, but I really love that. And this is uh, the rather boring part of the whole animation um, where everything is explained. If you can understand it just by looking at it, I did my job right. <laughs> I'm not really sure whether you can, but probably if you if you like sheing, you can. And um, yeah, what can I say about this project? Uh, it was very interesting. There's shape animation in there, um, loads of lighting, everything of course Blender internal as usual, nice materials, and um, the compositing is actually done in After Effects. That's not Blender. Because uh, back then, Blender just well wouldn't cut it for some of the compositing tricks I needed. So 3D Blender compositing is After Effects. Yeah, and uh, animated textures. I love animated textures. There was actually a nice soundtrack for that one, but uh, I couldn't bring it with me. My compression tools had some problems with it. And uh, yeah, something about this, um, there was a, a first version of that one year um, before I did this one. I did this one very recently. Um, they changed uh, the texture of the she and the, the model of these glide modules. They, um, well, changed them. And it would have really been nice to be able to just render textures in Blender, which you can't do, you know, there's no texture pass because that would have saved uh, a lot of time, so I had to re-render it all, and um, that was complicated. And just to give you an idea of how scenes this complexity look like, um, I, I prefer to use uh, the text function to make some notes on how to render certain scenes. There are, there are multiple cameras in here and a light dome for nice, uh, smooth, soft shadows. I tried real soft shadows, they didn't really work well. And uh, well, it, it's actually a pretty complicated scene if you when you look at it. And uh, here's some of the animation curves for uh, all this, the camera movement, which um, well, I, I learned uh, camera movement really is a, a topic of its own. If you really want smooth camera angles, it always seems so obvious on how to do it, but actually it takes really a lot of tweaking to get all these smooth angles and smooth movement around all the objects. It really takes a lot of time. It took, lo took longer than actually animating the she's and uh, stuff like that. And well, it's, it's always been like that. Uh, oh my god, no, I don't want to delete it. Uh, okay, and um, the last project I want to show you is something I just did very recently with um, Felix Böhm, he's over there. Finally, I found a partner who um, has all the Blender skills um, necessary, which is, uh, well, very hard to come by. And uh, he's got the time and uh, the spirit to also work professionally. And this is uh, this little animation. Um, how did I get this uh, contract? You're probably wondering, how do I actually get all these clients? Um, one thing is um, I know a producer and he's convinced of uh, my uh, quality and um, the more the more commercial projects you do the more the more you get obviously because um, once again the clients they can think abstract so if you uh, have one of these um, scientific projects like the lung and they're a medical company they say okay great he did a lung he can do our stuff and if you have something like these she's, then probably a sports company for snowboards thinks, ah, he can do she, so he can do snowboards. But they never get the idea if he can do a project like the lung, 
he might be able to do uh, something else as well. They have to see a project resembling what they need. And then they believe you that uh, you can provide them with it. So it's really important to have a big variety in your uh, showcase on, uh, on my website. Um, you can see that uh, because, yeah, they, they just believe you, uh, they just think you're the right man if you actually did something like they want to see anyway. And um, I, I, um, during my school days, I did a project, um, a pitch actually, uh, for a virtual pitch for Red Bull with a, with a Earth. Very nice project. Uh, I can show you because it, it wasn't done in Blender, it was done in Max uh, back then. But uh, a company, Icon Park, uh, saw this project and they said, well, we want to have some a, a little promotional animation. We have a very limited budget, of course. Um, they always do. Uh, but it was enough. And uh, can you do something for us? And that really gave me a chance to use all the new Blender features, uh, scene linking, uh, which is very, or it's really, that's great if you're working together. Felix could work on uh, the modeling while I was working on the animation. We just had to reopen the file and pop, uh, the new model was there. This is great for collaboration. And um, the node compositing uh, really worked wonders, as well as uh, node materials. Oh, it really has everything. Uh, well, let's take a look at it. The whole concept for this uh, animation uh, was provided by uh, the client, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, these aren't particles. These are actually real models um, animated along splines. As always, painstakingly done by hand, everything. There's, uh, the fun thing is um, you really always do that uh, in, in commercial projects because you never have the time to code anything. You don't have time to uh, code something useful in Python because you cannot be sure whether it will work or how long it's going to take you to get a stable result uh, by scripting something. So you do it by hand because by hand time, you can calculate the time, how long is it going to take me to animate all these little blue flashes around the earth. I, probably want 70 of them, that's enough. And this is, uh, I can calculate that. But it takes like, uh, how long did it take us, Felix? Uh, two afternoons, I guess. Animating the little, the flashes. Well, it, it must have been around two afternoons or two days. And, um, but this, you can calculate this. And you really never try scripting because it's just too insecure. Because if it won't work, you spend like two days for scripting, no results, time gone, uh, deadline, you can't hold the deadline and there's a reason why they call it the deadline. You, know, you can't get past it because the client needs it. They needed it exactly on one day because they were going to a trade fair, they had to submit it uh, beforehand and there was just, it's not an option to deliver it one day later, it's too late. And they probably are not going to pay or probably sue you, I don't know. It's really you really don't actually know about the real consequences of failing in a commercial project. Because you never do. No one ever does, really. Uh, it's just, you fear for the worst, really. Yeah, and uh, well, this project really was, uh, it was the most complex one compared to all the others. And at the same time, it really was the smoothest production. Uh, a big part due to Blender after um, Project Orange and everything actually providing um, the right tools and the right workflows for complex projects. Uh, working with two people on two architectures, actually uh, the worst combination of them all, Linux 64-bit uh, and Windows, and it's still, we could finish it, and uh, we had some, we ran into some well-known problems, as I know now, but uh, it really worked out, and it was complex. Uh, for example, I have the compositing tree for the whole thing here. Um, it's, it's actually not even that complicated, but still everything here is necessary to get this look. Um, the nice thing is, uh, that's really true, once you've got this all set up, just press render, uh, do composite, and out comes the finished animation. Uh, there was no post-production after effects here. Uh, it wasn't necessary, actually. You could achieve the whole look just by composing it uh, in Blender natively. 
which is very, very useful. And uh, well, let's have a look. Um, yeah, here you can see all these flashes. You know, every line around the Earth is painstakingly drawn, not drawn, but modeled by hand. Um, I'm pretty sure there there must be an easier solution to get this effect, like flashes coming out of all countries and landing in Munich, but there just was no time to try it out. So we went uh, the hard way, like it's so often necessary. And uh, what else? Yeah, the camera. See, um, interesting, what's the second um, sphere here? This sphere is the Earth, obviously. You can see it down here, the Earth with these uh, flashes. And this sphere here is um, the star's background because you can't use the Blender star system. I really uh, couldn't recommend it because obviously it's, it's more like a particle system and the stars pass in front of the camera and stuff like that. So um, we, we made up a star background put it in a sphere around the camera and uh, with compositing, you now all of a sudden have the Earth, which is outside of the sphere, inside of this sphere. This sphere travels with the camera, and um, but during compositing gets set in the background. It's on a different render layer, so by using node compositing, you can whip up all kinds of uh, interesting and nice scenes, and you can do it all in one um, place, you know, I mean, I could have uh, made two scenes uh, with the same camera animation or rendered out two different passes and composed them afterward, but it's not necessary anymore. You can all do it in one step and uh, you get your finished uh, project. It's, it's really very convenient. And uh, what else did I want to show you right? And some interesting um, node materials. Uh, we wanted to go, we have these lights on the backside of Earth. Now you can really see it very well, but well enough. Um, you know the blue marble textures uh, from the NASA, obviously, uh, the, the perfect resource for Earth, te Earth text uh, textures, and we wanted to see the lights on the dark side of Earth. So you can still make out the continent, and it looks interesting because in reality it's just black. You know, black is never really good. And um, this is just a little um, note tree that actually provides the lit side of Earth where there's no light. It's really dependent on the light. It wasn't even necessary in the end, but we weren't so sure. Perhaps we want to rotate the Earth and we want the, the dark side always with the light and the lit side uh, with the continents. And so, well, I just whipped up this little note tree that provides this effect. So if I put a spot on the other side, the, the city lights would disappear and it would be normal Earth. Very useful, very practical. And uh, well, it's, that's really working, working with the latest release really has become uh, very convenient. Oh, I still got one minute left. Um, any questions? Sure. Uh, wait, wait. wait. Um, when you did the, the sphere around the camera on the Earth, yeah. uh, why, didn't, why did you need to composite it? Why couldn't you just make it extremely large to enclose the whole scene? Okay, I got an answer to that one. Um, the sphere around the camera, um, provides the star background and um, I, I really wouldn't want to use a, a gigantic um, sphere for one reason because uh, the camera, the stars always are stationary to camera position. They only react to rotation, you know, if you rotate the camera the stars wander but if the camera moves they don't and it probably wouldn't have made a difference if I just used a big sphere but this um, sphere right here, uh, here we have it its uh, position is constrained to the camera and its rotation isn't. So it follows the camera everywhere, wherever, whatever I do with my camera, the stars will always wander with it. So their distance is infinite, so to speak. It, it, at least it looks like this. And it's a very clean solution for a star background because you don't have to worry about um, large camera movements when all of a sudden there would be some distortion in the star background. That's why I did it like this very practical and you get a small scene which is very good as well. Sure. Uh, couldn't you have environment mapped it using the uh, the, the yeah, world yeah. button on the material panel? Probably could have. Um, why didn't I do it? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think what was the reason I didn't use an environment map? More control um, because uh, with the sphere if I don't like the um, 
the piece of stars I see, perhaps if I have a nebula in it or a big sun or perhaps some, some planet, which is actually a backdrop, I can just rotate the sphere to get it right and I don't have to use these uh, like, like unintuitive controls uh, for uh, environment. So, well, it's just simpler. I don't really like uh, the whole environment thing in Blender right now. It doesn't work like I would expect it to work. So, um, who's next? Oh, see you. Thank you very much. Yeah.